working everyone. Um, we apologize for the delay um, for people that are watching us here in the, in the scenario and people that are also uh, online. So it's quite an honor uh, on behalf of the International Institute for Academics Studies at USP to open this uh, discussion, this I call plenary, uh, with Dr. Jean-Pierre Dupuy, uh, that was going to be bringing us his reflection on time complexity and catastrophe. So we thank you so much for coming, for opening and, and making this exposition uh, for us. Um, we'd like to thank uh, all the, the members, the discussants, uh, Eduardo Viola, Professor of uh, International Relations at the University of Brasilia. I think Viola is well known in the Brazilian Academy of Science, he has published many books and many articles on the climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and more recent climate change uh, in Brazil beyond the Amazon. It's your recent book. Uh, Ricardo Abramovay, I also believe he's well known in our academy. He's a senior uh, scholar at the Institute for Environment and Energy at, at USP. And Matthias, um, Matthias, um, Matthias is a visitor scholar of Stanford, and you are a lawyer yourself, and has been writing about the challenge of sustainability, uh, the uh, global sustainability. And then I thank you so much, um, um, Jose Ida Vega, who is our senior uh, scholar also here at AER, and who has been putting this table together, and will be also helping to moderate this discussion. So now I think no more uh, introduction. And oh yeah, I have a couple of announcements that we are alive. Uh, and then the site is www.pearusp.br. Uh, all the questions needs to be done on the microphone for people that has been here in the plenary. And then you should be identify yourself with your name and institutions if you can. And um, all the cell phones should be turned off or in the silent mode so we don't get any distraction. And uh, we also can, uh, for people who are remotely watching us, you can send your questions to eresponde.usp.br. And the video will be available on, the, um, on, on YouTube in a uh, couple, like seven days or so. Now I pass the word to Dr. Depuy. Algumas palavrinhas em português. Agradeço muito ao Zé Eli da Veiga, o professor da Veiga, por este convite. Agradeço muito a vocês todos por estarem aqui. E a vocês também por estarem aqui. Um, então, vou falar em inglês. Eu acho que é uma vergonha que dois idiomas latins, português e francês, precisam do inglês para se comunicar. Bom, realmente é uma coisa horrível. Bom, um, mas como a culpa é minha, claro, como eu costumo dizer, há 45 anos que eu falo português muito mal. Então... Prefiro, bom, foi o Zé Eli que preferiu que eu fale inglês, inglês. Ok, so let me switch to English. É difícil, né, porque os dois idiomas, português e inglês, são tão diferentes em vários aspectos, realmente. Pronúncia em particular, né? o stress é completamente diferente, etc. Então é difícil passar de um... A outro. But I'm going to speak English. So uh, we start now. We start now. Huh? Okay. My topic is, as you all can see, time complexity and catastrophe. And my goal today is to resort to a number of concepts derived from 
let's say, the theory of self-organizing complex systems to address a very specific issue, which is how can we think through the time that separates us from the major catastrophes and disasters that are announced. Think of climate change, nuclear war, um, loss of biodiversity, etc., etc., etc. So, my problem is very specific, and I'm going to treat it in philosophical terms because that's my discipline after all. And when I say philosophy, I mean more especially logic and metaphysics. Okay, that's my um, constraint in a sense because that's my discipline. Okay, so there are four parts in my presentation today. Each one will last 20 minutes. I will speak for 20 minutes, and Zaeli here is the guardian of time, the keeper of time. He will stop me um, adamantly when I go beyond 20 minutes. Then there will be... A, no, so, sorry, but it's very difficult for me to uh, have my mic, the microphone here, really. Um, um, and then there will be a, what, a 10 minute, 12 minute discussion among us each time. And then again, 20 minutes, four times. Okay, that's more or less the schedule. We'll see if we are able to uh, maintain it until the end. That's not obvious. Okay, so we start now. Um, the first topic is, oh, this is the menu, as it were, complexity and self-transcendence, the self-transcendence of the future, the time that is left to us, left to us before one of these major disasters or catastrophes, and fourth, that's my, what I bring, try to bring to the debate, especially in France and the US, what I called enlightened doomsaying. In French, it's catastrophisme éclairé. In, in Portuguese, it would be catastrophismo illuminado. Illuminado. Bon. And, okay. Complexity and self-transcendence. The issue is to... I'm going to give you... Um, uh, no, yeah, it's very difficult, really. To, if I had a stable microphone to be here, but okay. Uh, the issue is to um, come up with a definition of complexity. I'm going to propose one, which I think is the right one. Uh, but behind that, the concern is to understand how order can emerge without a designer, a maker. Uh, without God, to be sure. Um, I'm referring in passing to what is called intelligent design, which is an alternative to creationism. Okay, God designed everything from the start. But also an alternative to chance, randomness, etc. Neither a chance nor design. I'm going to propose a definition of uh, complexity, which is the following. To be complex is to be capable of complexification. This, this definition was proposed, or characterization, I should say, by John von Neumann, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Um, and it is what is called a recursive definition because the explanandum, that is what is to be explained, appears in the explanation, in the explanance. Okay, to be complex, we don't know what that means, is to be capable of becoming or creating even more complex. So let me show you just a very fast, uh, in a very fast way, the uh, two books of mine, The Mechanization of the Mind and the or On the Origins of Cognitive Science. I'm not going to... Um, it all started in cybernetics, a discipline that has been um, considered, that is being considered today to be obsolete and which Martin Heidegger completely misconstrued. But, okay, I don't want to elaborate on that. We have little time. Just a reference to Heidegger, which will return later. 
Okay. Three big names of cybernetics. John von Neumann, uh, one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, probably, for better or for worse. Um, he's the inventor, among other things, of the theory of automata. So, in some sense, of computers um, and of game theory, he computed um, all the computations for the H-bomb, which is less good than game theory, certainly, etc. Warren McCullough, he was a psychiatrist originally, and he became um, a logician uh, in order to tackle the problems that we are going to discuss. And most famous of all, who in my mind is not the most important one, Norbert Wiener, or Wiener if you prefer, uh, was also a great mathematician. So this occurred during uh, seven years, 10 conferences organized by the Macy, um, the Macy Foundation, which has nothing to do today, it's called the Macy uh, um, Department Stores. No, it was a medical foundation. And uh, 10 conferences that took place in New York City and the last one in Princeton. And that was the birthplace of cybernetics. Until 48, the name of the discipline was not cybernetics. The name was, and that's very interesting, tele teleological mechanisms, which at the time sounded like an oxymoron, contradiction in terms. Mechanisms are blind. Huh? That's what Arist Aristotle called um, efficient cause. Teleo teleological, that means guided by the end. That's what Aristotle called final cause. So how can you put together mechanisms and teleology? That's precisely the paradox that cybernetics managed to uh, solve, to clear, to clear up. Um, mechanisms are able to simulate, and that word is absolutely important, simulate, which means at the same time a mathematical model and also to make believe. It's not the real thing. It's a make believe of final causes. This is essential. So let's focus on John von Neumann. Um, that was in 1948 um, at, in um, Los Angeles, at the, in Pasadena, more precisely, at the California Institute of Te Technology. And von Neumann conjectured uh, something about complexity. Complexity, in his mind, was a magnitude of the th thermodynamical type. Everyone can read here, yes. Um, that is, b below a certain threshold, complexity is degenerative. That's the most common case, meaning that the degree of organization of the system can only decrease. But above a critical line, an increase in complexity becomes possible. Okay. To skip. A complex machine, in von Neumann's definition, which he called an automaton, is capable of bringing about something more complex than itself. And this more complex thing than itself, it's its own behavior. This does not come from this from anywhere. It comes from a number of discoveries of a logical and metaphysical nature that were made the previous decade by two fundamental, um, well, mathematicians, logicians, metaphysicians, whatever, philosophers, Kurt Gödel in 1931 and his theorem of the incompleteness, then Alan Turing in 1936 and the invention of the machine that is the basis of this, huh? that we call today a Turing machine, um, and John von Neumann, 1948. So there is a line going from one to the other. A Turing machine, I'm not going to describe, we have no time for that, but includes uh, a tape that is of in potentially infinite length and a head, a head uh, that reads, writes, and moves. So, at one given point in time, the head reads something that is written in a certain alphabet on the tape. 
<laughs> and the head decides two things. What to do next, that is to stay in place, to move to the left or to move to the right. But it also decides to change what's written on the tape. Okay, this is in principle extremely simple. The thesis that, that Turing and also someone called Alonso Church um, put forward was that anything that human mind can think through and express in finite terms, in a finite number of words, if you like, is computable by a Turing machine. Okay, so it's abs absolutely extraordinary. Um, because this, is, this seems to be a very trivial thing. Huh? Uh, but Turing demonstrated something else. A Turing machine can be considered to be an input-output machine. The input is what's written on the tape at time zero. The output is what's written on the tape at time t. Let's consider all the possible output of the Turing machine. That is, all the inscriptions on the tape that can be computed by the Turing machine. Well, it can be demonstrated that this set ensemble of outputs is not mechanical. That is, there is no Turing machine that can make sense of it. If you ask, does there exist a Turing machine that takes as input a given possible configuration of characters on the tape? And conclude yes or no, it, is, it belongs to the set of possible outputs. There is no such Turing machine which means that a Turing machine is capable of generating something that is not reducible to the mechanical, to machines. Gödel himself thought that his theorem was the, um, the, um, the evidence that a human mind is not reducible to a mechanism. This has this is still controversial. Soon, von Neumann prophesied the builder of automata of such machines will, will find himself as helpless before his creation as we feel ourselves before uh, when we are in the presence of complex natural phenomena. He had it that the engineer of the future will not be the one who devises and designs a structure capable of fulfilling a function that has been uh, assigned to him, for instance. Let's, let's invent a machine that is capable of carrying four persons from one point to another with wheels, etc., using gas, the car. No, the engineer of the future will be the one who knows he's successful when he's surprised by his own creations. This is the origin of the, co the notion of complexity. A complexity. Co uh, complex object or system is capable of generating something that is more complex than itself. This is the only definition. I know that, for instance, someone like Edgar Morin is very well famous in, in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Edgar Morin is an exceptional man, his life. He is an exceptional, he was an exceptional sociologist. But I must say that is a me very mediocre epistemologist. Okay, but uh, so it is the definition of complexity that is derived from his work doesn't is not worth uh, much. This is the only definition of complexity in the scientific world and philosophical world. From this, we can derive um, um, philosophical consequences. We can imagine a non-substantialist, in that case a non-vitalist ontology that is not reductionist. Uh, most reductionist accounts of life, for instance, most reductionist are, um, are um, um, 
Okay, let me give you an example. It will be simpler. Thanks to von Neumann's conjecture, you can say at the same time, physical chemical mechanisms, an H is missing, sorry, are capable of creating life. Okay, there is nothing in life that doesn't derive from physics and chemistry. But, two, life is infinitely more complex than the physical chemical mechanisms that generated it. Bottom up, it works very well. Top down, it's an enigma that is, but there is no logical metaphysical um, uh, contradiction in posing one and two. Everything occurs as if life was produced by something to which it is not reduced. So it's a, it's a non-substantialist, non-vitalist conception. That is, there is nothing in life that is not, that doesn't come from physics and chemistry, but it is also a non-reductionist because um, what has emerged is not reducible to the, its conditions of emergence. In the case of society, and here it was Friedrich Hayek, who uh, was a good friend of uh, John von Neumann, who posited as non-contradictory the two following propositions. Individuals generate society. Okay, There is nothing in society that has not been in, uh, generated by us, acting, reacting, etc., etc. However, society escapes us since society is infinitely more complex than the individuals are. Huh? So it's, there is nothing in society that is not produced by us, the individuals. However, society is infinitely more complex than us non-reductionist, and not, not substantialist, both at the same time. So another vocabulary to say self, so see, this, is, this is a case of self-transcendence, because the system is capable of generating something that transcends it, is the phrase, I don't know if you're familiar with it, bootstrapping, bootstrapping, uh, boots, and the laces here. Uh, so that's the origin of that is the um, a novel written in the 18th century by a German writer called Rapp, R-A-P-P, uh, telling the stories of the uh, Baron of Münchhausen. Yes. Okay, um, so that's part and parcel of the German culture. And when the founders of quantum mechanics, who were almost all Jewish, had to flee from Germany. They arrived in the US, carrying in their suitcases, of course, the German culture. And since they had to confront similar paradoxes in quantum mechanics, they invented the word in English, uh, bootstrapping. So the initial story, the Baron uh, can pull himself out of a swamp by his big tail. The second version, it's uh, thanks to his, uh, the laces of his boots. Okay, it's a case of bootstrapping. When you read the New York Times, you find this word, every other word almost. It's really part of the common American English language. And I'm almost finished, the first part. And the evidence that um, von Neumann's prophecy has become true and real is declarations like this. So this guy, Kevin Kelly, is an Australian who lives in the United States now. Uh, you have the reference to, his, uh, to a book in progress that is a, a, a book, uh, uh, online book. And um, so the title of that book is Will Spiritual Robots Replace Humanity by uh, 20, uh, tw uh, 2100? Okay, the answer is yes. But this is the phrase, it's absolutely phenomenal, extraordinary. It took us a long time to realize that the power of, te of a technology is proportional to its inherent out-of-controlness, out-of-controlness. 
its inherent ability to surprise and be generative. In fact, unless we can worry about a technology, it is not revolutionary enough. Okay, which is scary, of course. Uh, that is, as long as we produce, invent, design machines that we can control, technology is not interesting. Technology becomes interesting when we are capable of generating, designing, making, fabricating engines, ma machines, mechanisms, that although we are the authors of those machines, the inventors of those machines, escape us. We have here a quasi-theological uh, quasi paradox here. God create us, created us free, which means free to disobey him. Okay, so that's exactly the idea. And so technology has to take... So I, I, I'm going to stop here, the first part. Hey, it's okay at the time? Huh? As you like. No, 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 no. Uh, we are below um, 20 minutes or not? Yes. We are below. Okay. Uh, so uh, I studied for many years the case of what is called the NBIC convergence. NBIC, N for nanotechnology, B for biotechnology, I for information technology, and C for cognitive science. Uh, this convergence, so-called convergence, is, um, is um, let's say, uh, making credible progress in many labs in the world. And, um, for instance, the invention, oh, you have so many different things. For instance, the quantum computers are there, but also the creation of uh, biological entities or even the creation of life, what goes by the name of artificial life. Um, and of course, those who have the ambition to create life cannot but will that what they create will escape, escape them. Uh, if not, it wouldn't be life. Okay. So this is complexity and this is self-transcendence. So first part. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, Jean Pierre, for this um, exposition, uh, fruitful, insightful um, start of your talk. So, I will open to two questions from from you guys, the discussants. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, really, very, very interesting, thought-provoking. I am not a philosopher, just a political science, but very interested in these kind of things. Uh, so I, I would like to, to take advantage of your mention to Turing huh? and the last part about uh, uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science, and the convergence and dramatic progress in the last years. To ask you, I mean, there is something, my knowledge about Turing comes from Ray Kurzweil, that for okay, sure yes. you know very well, I mean, he was living in Stanford. He is now the director of uh, research of, at Google and the founder of Calicom, probably the most yeah. advanced and little secret yeah. company on, on artificial life. And so, uh, according to him, uh, there is a kind of, Turing was very, in his prediction about in this artificial intelligence overcoming right? by the end of the 20th century, according to Turing, uh, human intelligence, okay? Uh, he was correct. When, when uh, Kurzweil write the first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, this was, most people consider this, I mean, uh, wrong. Even because Einstein, for example, uh, in the, during the, in the late 50s stated that uh, it would be impossible artificial intelligence to overcome uh, human intelligence. You know? And so, but now, in the last 20 years, in the 21st century, things have changed dramatically. The predictions of Kurzweil in the book of 
1987, and particularly singularities near from 2006, have become, it is a, there is a record of, of um, uh, pre correct prediction that is uh, above 80%, it's amazing. So my question is to you, how would you introduce now this uh, more recent development, this uh, compared with the, the 20th century developments, eh? uh, about what do you think really that we are uh, close to artificial intelligence overcoming human intelligence? Do you think this connected with also the questions related to catastrophism? Because there are some thinkers or very influential people, Stephen Hawking or, or Elon Musk or even Bill Gates that say this is very dangerous, particularly artificial intelligence and it's very yeah. key to control it and to be very cautious in, in the development. So how do you, do, to do you introduce this more recent debate with your general reflection? And just to complement it, not a second yes. question. It was already also my question. So, <laughs> uh, do you do you see? Because you mentioned that this out of controlness is in fact very interesting. But do you see? And I think that complementing what Viola just said, yeah. do you see uh, this as uh, an existential threat to humanity? This moment when singularity occurs and machines become more intelligent than men? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. My question, very quickly, is how uh, intentioned uh, uh, in the core of human action uh, interferes with self-transcendence? Because you talked about uh, Aristotelian inspiration in this uh, contradiction between uh, mechanism yes. and uh, intentions. Yeah. And there is, uh, inspired by the works of Amartya Sen, there is a critic of the conventional view of economics uh, as this conventional view uh, uh, evacue, uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, get, rid of. get rid of ethics. Yeah. And in all this reflection, even the reflection about God, I think the, the, the Saramago book uh, on the Evangel of Jesus Christ, yes. there is a dialogue fantastic. Why God create the creature just to love God? And there is a very beautiful song of Chico Buarque, Sobre Todas as Coisas, with the, thing, with, with the same theme. Uh, my, my question is, which is the place of human intentions, of human projects, of human goals, of the Aristotelian uh, definition of ethics, which is the, the science who studies the goals, the finalities of human action, how it fits with your frame. Okay, okay. oh my God, how, how much time do we have? I mean, but, no, but, <laughs> I thought you were so it's adamant. A conversation. Okay, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, huge questions, and thank you very much. Okay, the first, yeah, the same question, the two of you here. Um, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know what to answer because I'm torn between, I know all these, well, some of them I know them personally, like, um, like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, etc., uh, etc. Et they were my students at Stanford a long time ago. Uh, doesn't make me rich huh? because they are all billionaires. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but one of them is very interesting. He was a student of mine in in, in France in, at, at the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, um, and he's now a billionaire too is in charge of artificial intelligence at Facebook. Uh, his name is Yann Lequin, L-E-C-U-N. When he was still a student, that was his thesis, he devised something which, which he called, and now this is a common term, 
uh, deep learning. Uh, okay. So the invent the inventor of all that, by the way, is this guy here, uh, Warren McCulloch. Warren McCulloch, 1943, a beautiful paper, um, which was already without the name uh, neural networks, a theory of neural networks, in which he demonstrated, well, he thought he could demonstrate the equivalence between a neural network and a Turing machine. Okay, um, that was so 1943. Um, so, Yann Lequin devised, and then this neural network thing disappeared from the field of science and from the field of artificial intelligence in particular. Artificial intelligence was something, something completely different. It has nothing to do with neur neural networks, Herbert Simon, etc. It was more like a computer, if you like, propositions, etc deriving from one from one from the other from the others etc um, now there is a return and Yann Lequin is responsible for that to the, the to the um, this mathematical modeling called neural networks he added a great number of layers hence the word the phrase deep learning deep means great number of layers um, with feedbacks between the levels and which seems to be capable of great things in artificial intelligence. But what's interesting is that Jan Lequin's position is to say there is nothing to fear of, nothing. Because we are at such an elementary level that our machines, what can they do? They can beat, to be sure, uh, they can beat uh, the uh, champion of chess or champions, which is more extraordinary, of Go. The, the Go, I don't know, yeah, of the, uh, the Chinese uh, game, etc., which is fantastic, but we don't play chess or Go uh, every day. I mean, it's uh, so what is called generalized artificial intelligence, we are still at the very, very beginning. So, according to Yann Lequin, we have nothing to fear. And then, on the other hand, you have people like, as you said, Elon Musk, uh, etc., and, and a transhumanist, uh, uh, etc., who say what we are able to do now is extraordinary, we are, uh, and we are on the brink of a radical change in the history of humankind, uh, trans, transhumanism. So I don't know, because these are two kinds of people who are extremely knowledgeable in these domains and who have completely different opinions about whether it's dangerous or not. Uh, Really, I'm, I prefer to have a modest response. <laughs> I don't know. Um, now, uh, no, I wouldn't say my intuition, but my wish in a sense. Well, and my wish is absolutely contradictory, self-contradictory. On the one hand, I find that incredibly exciting. But at the same time, I think it's really scary when you see someone and that's why I showed that slide, uh, like um, like um, <coughs> like uh, Kevin Kelly saying, unless a technology surprises us, it's not interesting. An interesting technology, I'm saying, I'm thinking this re very uh, it's really uh, scary. Yeah, because uh, there are many ways of surpri surprising ourselves. Huh? Some are better than others. Um, Okay, so now your question about, uh, I will focus on a word you used, ethics, eh, which is very important in your formulation of the question. Um, I've been very much influenced by a category of uh, thinkers, all initially at least German speakers, um, all Jews, and all students of a Nazi philosopher. Heidegger, okay. Uh, well, yeah, that's uh, one of the paradoxes of um, 20th century philosophy. So they are Ivan Illich, who was really my master, whom I met, uh, worked with, etc. Ivan Illich, born in Vienna. Um, Hannah Arendt, Günther Anders, and uh, Hans Jonas. I'm going to talk about them later. And they have a general 
um, they have something in common, a conception of a new conception of evil, evil as not related to human intentions. Illich went so far as to say something like, today we have to fear more people with good intentions than thugs, thieves, uh, bad people, etc., etc. The most dangerous people today are people with good intentions. And I've studied a specific case. I've worked on both uh, um, um, f uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima, the two accidents, two dramas. And I've written a book on that in which I presented what I call the nucleocrats of the world, that is, the, those who are in charge of uh, nuclear energy, as being people of good intentions, but all the more dangerous for that. I received very good reviews from these nucleocrats, and I received letters, uh, threats of death, death threats, from ecologists, etc. How can you say that these guys have good intentions? But my response was, it's even more scary when the danger comes from people with good intentions. Huh? You, you see, um, yeah, people of goodwill, etc., who are the managers of those self-transcendent machines, in a sense. Okay, although nuclear energy, a yeah, nuclear reactor is not really an advanced technology, right? so, but nevertheless, it's there. Okay, so I think uh, we had some sort of uh, discussion, and I would ask you if you could just go straight to your next two points without interruption. Is that ah. okay? Yeah? Well, it's okay. Yeah? Can do second, and then third. second yeah, yeah, and third. Well. And then we open again to discussion and also to the plenary. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, I will follow what your, okay. your, your instructions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but that, of course, that's the, uh, it was predictable yeah. that the discussion it's sure. itself would mm -hmm. take. Mm -hmm. And it's, okay, so, Second part, the self-transcendence of the future. Uh, I'm not saying that all conceptions of the future present the future as a, as a self-transcendent entity, but consider the following. In our industrial advanced societies, more and more, we guide ourselves, our actions, on a certain image of the future. There are lots of institutions in Brazil as well as in the US as well as in France, etc., that tell us what the future in such, along some dimensions, of course, will be. The rate of inflation, the result of the next election with the polls, etc., um, the predictions of the traffic on the freeway next weekend. Um, some things that are more important, um, like the possibility, I don't like that word, but the eventuality that the um, virus, current virus, um, threatens, as I read yesterday in the New York Times, that's a possibility, between one third and one half of the adult world population. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that everyone will die, but uh, every, almost everyone will be affected by it. Okay, so we have images of the future that are given to us, and in general, they are common to all of us. That is, we take the future as a benchmark, as a reference point, and we decide on what to do today on the basis of these images of the future. At the same time, we know very well that the f this future depends, in particular, on what we are doing today. So the future comes from us, partly, and at the same time, it transcends us. It's a case of self-transcendence. 
So I developed, sorry for the auto publicity, but I don't spend time on this. Uh, Economy and the Future, book of mine. So within the cybernetics period, that is between 1943 and 1954, let's say, about that, a very important distinction was made by the cyberneticians between two forms of generation of order from noise, that is from Noise means here, not uh, barulho. It means information without meaning. Huh? OK, like the white noise in the uh, electronic uh, devices that our friends there are using. So order from noise and complexity from noise. And it's important to understand the difference between order from noise and complexity from noise, I'm going to present two case studies that illustrate that distinction. Buffon. Buffon was a French naturalist in the 18th century. Uh, a century before, sorry, I'm uh, going to sound uh, chauvinist here, or uh, uh, a century before Darwin, he conjectured that man descends from the monkey. Uh, okay, But he was also a major mathematician. Uh, mathematics play, play a very important role in uh, what I'm, everything that I'm saying here. And uh, he devised the following experiment that is being carried out in many cities in the world, in Paris to be sure, it started there at the end of the 19th century. Um, it exists in San Francisco, in New York City. I think I've been told that it's, you, it's somewhere in Sao Paulo. And this is the uh, what the uh, experiment consists of. Every visitor of the, the, in French, in Paris, it's a palais de la découverte, palais de la but there are, can be a planetarium, etc. Every visitor. And there are zillions and zillions and millions of visitors every year. And so over a period of uh, one century, of course, it's, uh, every visitor is invited to throw a needle onto a uh, set of horizontal lines that are electrified. The distance between the lines are equidistant, and the distance between, distance between two lines is D. The needle that you throw onto that grid, its length is D divided by 2. So there are two possible cases. Either the needle intersects one of the line, and then there is electric signal. The, uh, or it doesn't intersect. There are no other cases. And there is a computer that computes the number of cases of intersection and computes the frequency of intersections. The amazing result is that whether you are one, let's say, in Paris, two in uh, uh, Sao Paulo, three in New York City, four in, uh, New York, in uh, San Francisco, it doesn't matter. You have exactly the same phenomenology. That is, you have a series of oscillations that dampen out and converge towards a value that is the same wherever and whenever you do this experiment. And this value is 0 0.318309. Uh, well, you say, my god, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And then you realize that this value is the converse of pi, pi being the ratio between the perimeter of the circle, perimeter of the circle, and the, its diameter. So this is 1 over pi. This is nothing but the law of large numbers, which says that the, uh, when you have a, a repeated experiment like this, without correlations between the different moments, then the frequency converges towards the a priori probability. And Buffon was able to demonstrate in two lines so if we had time, I would present that, but that's not our object today. The demonstration that the a priori probability for an intersection is 1 over pi. Remarkable. OK, this is at the same time 
extraordinary. For, for instance, in Paris, um, at the Palais de la Découverte, it's a round room, and on the wall, in a circular fashion, you have one, for the time being, 100, about 100,000 decimals of Pi that are being inscribed. Uh, it, and each time, it's being actualized, etc. So you can discover the value of pi down to 100,000 decimals in that way. It's extraordinary, but at the same time, it's nothing but the law of large numbers. Frequency tends towards probability. This is order from, uh, order from noise. Now, consider the following experience. Complexity from noise. It was devised, devised sorry, by a, a, math, a Hungarian mathematician named Polya, who was at Stanford, the professor of uh, John von Neumann, by the way. Yeah, but okay, it doesn't matter. So a student of mine drew, drew uh, this. Uh, so this is supposed to be an urn. Huh? So this, uh, an urn is not a box with a slot. Huh? because it's not, okay, this is just a detail, but imagine that it's an urn. In the urn, you have one black ball and one white ball at the beginning. And you have a stock of a, potential, a pen, potentially infinite number of white balls and black balls. So the experiment consists in pulling out from the urn one of the, one of the balls, look at his color, put the ball back into the urn, and add a ball of the same color. So for instance, if the first time you put out a black ball, okay, you put the black ball into the, the urn, and you add one black ball. So now you have two black balls and one white, white ball. And you, you do the experiment again. Of course, the chances of a black ball to come out are increased because now it's, you have two thirds uh, of chances, etc., etc. And the question is, how is the proportion of black balls, let's say, going to evolve over time? This is very easy to simulate in a, even in my on my uh, iPhone here. No publicity for Apple, but uh, if you just need a generator of random numbers. Okay, so it's uh, so you do the experiment, and you find this. That is like in the Buffon case, you have the same phenomenology or phys yeah phenomenology. That is, you have a series of dampened oscillations and convergence towards a, val a value which here is zero point seven eight six. And you ask yourself, how come? that there is what is called in physics this break in symmetry. The, the experiment is perfectly symmetrical. How come, you, how come you arrive at a value that... So you think twice and you decide to do the experiment again. And this is what you get. Each time you do the experiment, you converge towards a value but this value is a result of the experiment. This is more extraordinary than the Buffon needle case. Um, that is, the, convert, the value of the convergence doesn't pre-exist the dynamic. It is created by the dynamic. This can be represented in the following way. This is complexity from noise. Um, you have the dynamics oscillations. You have an attractor, an attractor that's the value that emerges. Everything occurs as if simulation. The attractor was guiding the dynamics. It's there, like o 1 over pi in the before experiment. But at the same time, the attractor is a product of the dynamics. The dynamics converges towards an attractor that is generated by itself. The evolution is said to be path-dependent, 
and the attractor, but doesn't matter. It's a, it's a term, eigen behavior, that mixes German eigen, which means self in English, and behavior, uh, comportement, comportment, uh, self comportment. Uh, um, so the value of the convergence doesn't pre exist the, the history of the system, it is a product of the history of the system. This is extraordinary. Oh, but this is a metaphor. I mean, this is pure mathematics, and it's a metaphor of something much more profound. That is that complex systems precisely, and that's why it's possible to talk in terms of te teleological mechanism. <coughs> this is purely mechanistic, but it simulates te teleology, that is being the final cause. But the final cause is a product of the history itself. So this can be a history, uh, sorry, a metaphor for the history of humankind in a sense. Uh, we have very often the impression that we are heading towards some omega point, uh, but this omega point is actually the outcome of the particular history we are in. Maybe in a different universe, the convergence would be towards a different value, etc. Uh, okay, I don't want to enter into this discussion, but uh, uh, Darwin himself had the intuition that natural selection was not necessary for evolution to take place. And in the sixth, sixth edition of uh, the, the Origin of Species, he wrote, I'm convinced that selection has been the main but not the exclusive means of modification. At the time, he used the term modification, not evolution, but it's the same. Um, and of course, today, well, I would say the theories of evolution I prefer, that could be subjective, um, are of this kind. There is no principle of selection here. There is no selection. Or if there is a principle of selection, it is the history itself that selects itself. This is a funny illustration of what I'm trying to say. So this is, um, I hope it's going to work. This is um, drawn from an Argentinian uh, magazine, business magazine. Um, well, first I should say a few words uh, of the, the case of the two absent-minded professors. I'm absent-minded. When I'm on Stan Stanford campus, very, I mean, quite often, I'm not going to say it's often, it's every day, but from time to time, I'm with a friend of mine, and we are walking towards a place on campus that we, where we know a lecture will be given by a famous thinker. Each one of us believes that the other knows the way, <laughs> but n neither of them knows the way. And so... That this dynamic creates a certain trajectory up to a certain point, of course, because sooner or later one will say, uh, but are you sure that's the way? No, but I'm following you. No, I'm following you. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, case. Okay. So it goes very fast, so be very attentive. Okay. You have two blind people. Neither of them realizes that the other one is blind. The first one asks, are you crossing the street? What, what he means by that is, you see that I'm blind, so are you ready to help me? And the other one says yes. Because the other one, knowing that he is blind and not seeing that the first one is blind, understands the question in a very different way. Meaning, um, are you crossing the street? That means, do you want me to help you? And of course, the guy, the second guy says, yes, I want you to help me. So if we had more time, I would show you that in the crisis of 2008, the collapse, collapse of, the, of the financial system, many cases like this of two blind, of course, blindness is a metaphor here, huh? happened. Huh? Okay, this is how this mechanism of double imitation, in a sense, creates disaster. Okay. 
So, conclusion of the year. Step two. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read out uh, this. Complex systems, made up of many elements interacting in non-linear ways, possess remarkable properties, so-called emergent properties, that justify their description in terms that one should have thought had been forever banished from science in the wake of the Galilean Newtonian revolution. Thus, it is said of these systems that they are endowed with autonomy, autopoietic, Francisco Varela said, that they are self-organizing, that their paths tend toward attractors, that they are path-dependent, that they have intentionality, the system has intentionality, and directionality, as if their paths were guided by, by an end that gives meaning and direction to them, even though this end has not yet been reached, as if, to borrow Aristotelian categories, purely efficient causes were capable of producing effects that mimic, simulate, the effects of the final cause. Okay, so I think it's, I hope it's clear, the notions of complexity and self-transcendence were born together apropos of machines, apropos of machines. Uh, that's interesting. And then, of course, they were applied to human beings, societies, etc. Okay, the time that is left to us, um, that is left to us today, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, and in parentheses, the delay. The time that is left to us, it's a question that each one of us thinks about, of course, because the first example we can think of, in my case, the first example I can think of is my own personal death. Ah, the same for each one of you. Every human time is limited in time, precisely. There is a term, an end. Okay, and the question is, how can we reflect on the time that separates us from this end? This is a beautiful uh, quote from the Argentinian, that's my intellectual hero, by the way, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, he insisted in having his name pronounced Borges, by the way, the Portuguese way and not the Spanish way, because he explained to me once when I had the chance of meeting him in Paris that his name came from uh, Brazil, Borges. So Jorge Luis Borges, okay. He was interviewed by, in Buenos Aires by uh, a Brazilian journalist, and this is what he said. The question was, once more, fale de nos de si, uh, fale nos, sorry, oh, now it's Portuguese. Fale nos de si, Senor Borges. Fala de mim, mas eu nada sei de mim, eu não sei nem a data da minha morte. Tudo está aqui. Nós sabemos, bom, uh, we know that he was born, okay, this he knew in 1899. We knew, we know that he died in Geneva, by the way, where he had been educated as a teenager in uh, 1986. Yeah, and I think the interview was in 19, 1983 or four, something like that, two hours. <laughs> something even more, again, my chauvinism, French chauvinism, maybe more impressive, it's by Montaigne. Tous les jours vont à la mort, le dernier y arrive. In English, all days travel toward death, the last one reaches it. Okay, todos os dias vont para a morte, o último chega lá. Um, so it sounds like a tautology, of course, but it's not at all a tautology because we don't know, in general, what the last day is. No, it's, uh, it's all there. So, okay, so this is the issue I want to treat. How can we think through, conceptualize, if you prefer, the time that separates, separates us from an, an announced disaster, death is the major disaster for each one of us. Okay. So my, as I said before in the end of 
discussion, my models here are uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, uh, her friend at the time, uh, Hans Jonas, uh, supposedly the inventor of the so-called precautionary principle. In uh, uh, Günther Anders, who was Hannah Arendt's first husband, while she had an affair with her common professor, Martin Heidegger. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of the two of them when they were still in when they were in exile in Paris before moving separately uh, to uh, the US. Um, okay, so I'm going to need you, uh, Zeli. Uh, Anders, several times, wrote about the theme I've just uh, presented, um, the time that separates us from, from a major disaster and he told the story, it was his own story of Noe, Noah eh? and, uh, and the ark and, uh, and the flood in English. Como es? Diluvio in Portuguese, eh? Okay. So this is uh, borrowed from a book of his, Endzeit und Zeitenende, Gedanken über die Atomare Situation, the end of time, and the time of the end, reflections over our atomic situation, published in 1972. And it's a variation, of course, on Genesis 7, the story of the flood. Então, como ele insistiu muito que tem que ser lido, eu vou ler, mas bastaria que cada um. Não, 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 tem que ser lido como, como um teatro, como. Okay. Um... Que é no, exatamente o que eu não sou. <laughs> Noé estava cansado de fazer o papel dos profetas da desgraça e de sempre anunciar uma catástrofe que não acontecia e que ninguém levava a sério. Um dia ele se vestiu com um saco velho e jogou cinzas sobre sua cabeça. Este gesto só era permitido àquele que chorava por seu filho querido ou por sua esposa. Vestido com o traje da verdade, ator da dor, ele voltou para a cidade decidido a colocar a seu favor a curiosidade, a maldade e a superstição dos habitantes. Logo ele reuniu em volta dele uma pequena multidão curiosa e as questões começaram a aparecer. Perguntaram a ele se alguém havia morrido e quem era esta pessoa morta. Noelis respondeu que muitos estavam mortos e, para grande divertimento dos seus ouvintes, ele disse que estes mortos eram eles mesmos. E quando lhe perguntaram quando esta catástrofe tinha acontecido, ele respondeu, amanhã. Aproveitando-se então da atenção e da confusão, Noé ergueu-se com toda a sua grandeza e se pôs a falar depois de amanhã, o dilúvio será algo que terá sido. E quando o dilúvio, dilúvio tiver sido, tudo o que não é terá jamais existido. Não, tudo o que, é. que é não terá jamais existido. Quando o dilúvio tiver levado tudo o que é, tudo o que terá sido, será tarde demais para lembrar porque não existirá mais ninguém. Então, não haverá mais diferença entre os mortos e os que o choram. Se eu vim diante de todos, foi para inverter o tempo, para chorar hoje as mortes, os mortos de amanhã. Depois de amanhã, será tarde demais. Com isso, ele voltou para casa, tirou seus trajes, a cinza que cobria seu rosto e foi para seu ateliê. À noite, um carpinteiro bateu à sua porta e disse... Deixe-me ajudá-lo a construir o arco, para que isto não se torne verdadeiro. Mais tarde, um telhador se juntou aos dois, dizendo, Chove sobre as montanhas, deixem-me ajudá-los para que isto não aconteça. Muito Deu certo? Sim, perfeito. Perfeito e perfeitamente Sorry, it's... Supposed to speak English, and um, and this parable, this allegory, allegory. Sorry, I'm stirring the, 
the language is now, um, is extraordinary because it says better than I could ever say it the, the position or the prof, prophet of doom, uh, profeta di disgrazia. Uh, okay. So nobody uh, hears what the pro or understands or accepts what the prophet of doom is saying, prophesying the catastrophe that is coming. Uh, think of climate change, think of the possibility of nuclear war, think of the loss of biodiversity, think of the germs produced by nano biotechnology, etc., etc. Uh, nobody really pays attention to that. I mean, it's uh, I, at least in our countries, I think. Um, uh, so, Noe has to find a way to catch the attention of these people. And so, what he does, he stages what he calls himself an inversion, inversion of time. He considers the future as if the future were the past. In English, and the, 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 the grammatical tense is using, and you insisted on that, bravo, in your reading, is called in English the future perfect. In French, we say le futur uh, antérieur, talvez seja a mesma coisa em português, não? Futuro anterior, futuro do pretérito. Uh, futuro do pretérito. But what's interesting in, in English language is called the future perfect. Perfect. What does this future has <laughs> perfect that the usual future doesn't have? Well, the future perfect transforms the future into the past and gives the future two properties that we ascribe to the past, the fact that it's determinate and the fact that it's fixed. So how does the future perfect does that? When, when you come to my place tonight, uh, um, it will be too late. Huh? Uh, I will already have finished eating my dinner. So you will, I won't give you anything to eat. Um, when you come to my place tonight, contrary to what may uh, the come here, which in Portuguese, and that's very interesting, that, that shows that uh, Portuguese grammatic, uh, uh, grammar, sorry, Portuguese grammar is really more subtle than English grammar or the French grammar. You have a special tense called the future of subjunctive. subjunctive. Quando vocês chegarem, futuro do subjunctive. Uh, subjunctive. Uh, in French, it's the present of the indicative. Quand vous venez chez, quand vous, no, it's a, sorry. It's a future of indicative. Uh, quand vous viendrez chez. Uh, when you come to my place tonight, I will have finished eating my dinner. So I consider the future tomorrow from the viewpoint of something that is if even more in the future, uh, the day after tomorrow. And then the tomorrow appears to be like the past, determinate and fixed. And this is what we need, the prophet of doom Profeta di disgrazia needs to give the future a weight of reality that usually we don't give it. We don't give the, the, the future because, and why don't we give the reality of the future the importance that is needed? Because we consider that the future is open. Because we believe in our free will. This could happen, but I could do this, that and it would not happen. Here, the future appears to be determinate and fixed. Uh, many people intuitively have discovered the same thing, and I'm going fast now, four or five examples of, of Al Gore at the end of his movie um, has been uh, an uh, inconvenient truth. The first movie he made, the vice president of the US, huh, about climate change. Future generations may well have occasion to ask themselves, what were our parents thinking? Why didn't they wake why didn't they wake up when they had a chance? We have to hear that question from them now. So the stupid reaction, of course, is to say, how can our the future generations speak to us? 
they do not exist. And maybe they won't exist if we blow up the planet. So we imagine here an inversion of time, really. People want, OK, I'm going to skip Hans Jonas, who, uh, well, he speaks well, the, the, what can serve as a compass in a boussole, boussole. Uh, the anticipation of threat itself. It is only in the first glimmer of its tumults that comes to us from the future, as if we received signs from the future. But uh, more interestingly enough, you know, there was a COP20, the one that was just before Paris, that was in Copenhagen, that was a total disaster. And the uh, Greenpeace people put up a number of posters like this, which say, so that was 10 years ago. And so the date was 2020, which at the time was the future. <laughs> and the phrase is, so you see Obama has white hair, etc. is much older by 10 years. And Obama is saying, I'm sorry, we could have stopped catastrophic climate change, and we didn't. So they did the same with all the leaders at the time, for instance, Lula, Lula, Lula saying, I'm sorry, uh, etc., etc. Lula is still president. Uh, no, he's not, uh, he's not president again. He might. This is Angela Merkel. This is Sarkozy, my president at the time, etc. That's it. Two, two more chapters. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dupuis. So I, I will open now for, for questions. Or, uh, Zaini? Well, um, I'd like you to explain the relationship, maybe the difference, between what you say and what uh, Maturana and uh, especially Varela said about auto-organization instead of self-transcendence, uh, uh, self-organization, yeah. and uh, autopoiesis. That's first question. And the, the, the second, I, I don't know if it's a question, but um, uh, Darwin left uh, a theory about populations. So, so when I see people talking about evolution, but they are not thinking about population, it's a kind of uh, ingenuity. I don't know. Uh, yeah. a, a, a lot of people make this mistake, in my view. Yeah. OK. Maybe other colleagues. No, Do you have other? I'm afraid I'm going to forget. Huh? <laughs> These are two. But it's easier as you answer everything after. Uh, uh, for me, it's more difficult. Yeah, but, I know. But, yeah. Okay. Okay. Then. Yeah. One. One more. Y you will have to remind to remind me of your question. Okay. Two questions. Okay. Two more questions. Yeah. yeah. So just um, trying to provoke your thoughts. Uh, during the 80s, with the new uh, intensification of the Cold War and a lot of very dangerous situations happening, not equivalent to the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62, but a lot of things, there were many services in Europe and United States that said that people was thinking, almost certain, that the world would finish in a global nuclear war. And even a lot of people yeah. didn't want, have decided. In the 70s, they, they were ready to have children because the situation, because of the start and salt treaties, was improving, let's say, since the late since the 60s. Yeah. But in the 80s, there were the first half of the 80s, opposite to the second half of the 80s, because of Gorbachev, there was really a major shift in mindset in the developed countries in the saying that catastrophe is, will happen necessarily. Yeah. So this would be the opposite of the idea that uh, it's a kind of enlightened catastrophe and a mass enlightened catastrophe. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, but we have one more question, right? Okay. Two questions. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, so we have. But you have two questions. Okay. So remind me. Uh, I'm still suffering. I'm still so Yeah, but I'm so, still suffering of the. Oh yes, what's the? Uh, okay, your question about Varela um, is about everything that I've said, and not only the last points. Huh? No. Okay. Um, Francisco Varela, who was a great friend of mine, huh? and I'm, uh, he died uh, young, um, um, yeah, of the kind of disease that he was studying as a biologist, uh, self-immune disease. Um, a great, great mind. Was always keen, was always um, stable in his view that his theory of autopoiesis, of self-organizing systems, he had no, nothing to say about its, the implications of this theory for the, the theory of society, the social, human affairs, etc. He was a bit hypocritical. Uh, I'm saying that as a friend, of course. Um, because actually, it didn't discourage, and particularly didn't discourage me, to not to apply his main concepts, the concept of autopoiesis, etc., etc., to society, human affairs, etc. Uh, um, but he himself um, wouldn't do that, didn't do that. Hence, the fact that the notion of self-transcendence, because that was your question, huh? was not so important for him. Because it's, above all, in the framework of human affairs. When I talk about the future, for instance, okay, present a theory, and, I'm, and the last point will be even more so, a theory of the future, what I'm talking of is the future, human future, the future as a human reality. Huh? It's not the future of the universe. It's not the uh, etc. etc. So, not for life. and life is of course in between. By the way, you remember the three founders of cybernetics: John von Neumann, Max Kullach, and Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener, the less interest, the least interesting of the three. But Max Kullach, sorry, John von Neumann was keen on treating first the issue of life. And McCulloch was keen on treating first the issue of thought, cognition, etc. And it was McCulloch who won, unfortunately, I would say. Because life, so life is in between. I mean, it's, uh, it's, um, Varela and is life. life, biology, biosystems, ecosystems, etc. Yes. But, there are a number of uh, great thinkers, not talking of myself, who in uh, Germany, for instance, uh, Niklas Luhmann, uh, great sociologist, um, a competitor of Habermas, less known than Habermas, unfortunately, who imported all of Maturana's and uh, Varela's concepts to the theory of society. I, I could cite many, many other examples. And Francisco, so Maturana, there was a split between Maturana and Francisco Varela. Huh? Maturana um, um, uh, was angry at that. He said that has nothing to do with what we uh, uh, started. Francisco Varela was much more open. Okay. So it's difficult to say, but I can only speak for myself. Okay. I think that those concepts have proved very, very useful for me uh, in the study of the problems I'm talking about, uh, in particular human catastrophes. I mean, it's uh, your second question is about um, Darwin. Um, okay, I learned from um, a friend of mine, uh, 
Belgian. I don't know if she, if she is known here. Her name is Isabel Stengers. She worked, yeah, she worked with, um, is dead now, with the uh, Nobel Prize in, uh, Nobel Laureate in uh, Chemistry, uh, Ilya Prigogine. Mm -hmm. I owe her a very important distinction between two kinds of mathematical modeling, or two kinds of modeling, let's say. Modeling of real phenomena and modeling of concepts. So, almost everything I presented here today, it's modeling of concepts. Eh? For instance, the Olya Urn scheme, eh? with his, uh, let's say, converging towards, etc. This is a model that, that mathematical that has been applied to many, many problems in, for instance, epidemiology, epidemiology, uh, in particular the way viruses circulate in the world, etc. Um, and and the, the, the rate at which uh, um, um, a virus like the coronavirus, that's, the, yeah, the coronavirus, now it has a more fancy name, but um, the rate at which it stabilizes, uh, it's path dependent. It has been shown that it's path dependent. It's linked to the history of the, etc. It's not, so it's impossible to predict, in a sense, because history will tell. The final explanation of history, it's history itself. Uh, so these models that I've presented have been used in order to modelize or model real phenomena. That's not the way I treat them. I treat them as a way of illustrating concepts. And here, it's a concept, the concept, I'm not going to repeat, of self-transcendence, uh, path dependency, complexity, etc. You see, so uh, Francisco Varela and Maturana created a theory of uh, evolution, eh? alternative to, uh, to Darwin, post-Darwinian, you could say. Okay, that's not what I'm doing here. Eh? You cannot judge the value of this concept just by the, in a sense, elementary illustrations, mathematical, these are math very simple mathematical puzzles, even if they are interesting because they are amazing, they lead to surprise. Um, that's how I can defend those concepts against your valid objection. I mean, there is no, uh, the, the, all the debate about the role of populations in evolution is not, yeah, it's not my problem here. Thank you. Could you take the third question? Yes, the yes. question after the, the, the end, after the next exposition? Yeah, uh, actually, that's true. It's it's better because I'm going to answer partially your question with what I'm going to say now. Okay, we must be way behind schedule, huh? We are exactly on schedule. On schedule? So everything is all right. Okay, so the last part is the most important for me because that's my own work. And so far, I've just presented things. <laughs> that I've been a student of, but now I'm going to present, well, in just a few minutes, uh, my own contribution to this debate. Um, and the debate being <coughs> the real catastrophes that we anticipate, but we don't know when. So let me tell you that we, we won't spend much time on this. I believe that climate change is a very serious thing that is extraordinarily dangerous, that we are on the brink of something really bad, but I still believe that there are things that we can do. Okay, um, the book I'm writing now has, in French, has as a title, translating into English, well, in French first, Le Temps qui nous reste. No, sorry, sorry, that was my first title, that's a bad title. No, it's, it's, it is, le, um, it is, my God, I've forgotten. Um, le, 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 oh, incredible, eh? It's the fatigue, it's the time difference, it's the, my God, my own book, the book I'm writing. Um, no, 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 okay. Il est encore temps. 
There is still time. There is still time. I in that thing. Then. Okay. So, very very serious, but there are things that we can do. Uh, the same with uh, that's my last book that has been published about nuclear war. It's there, and that's how I'd like to answer your question later. Bon. So I called, as I said, um, my uh, approach enlightened doomsaying, that is, catastrophismo illuminado, or catastrophisme éclairé in French. Esclarecido, eh? Não, mas no, porque tem uma publicação brasileira do meu livro, que é iluminado. Bom, eles escolheram... Não, eu sei, mas, mas da categoria de catastrofismo éclairé foi uh, uh, traduzida como catastrofismo ilustrado. Bom, ok. É que referência ao século das luzes. Uh, sim, claro, claro, sim, exatamente. E, and I'm going to critique a new movement that exists in France. Uh, these people call themselves collapsologues. Uh, collapse from the word collapse uh, in Latin first and English. In French, it would be effondrement. Non sei o que seria em português. Não, mas porque uma coisa brutal. É um evento. Afundamento. A fundamento, você poderia dizer a fundamento da, da biodiversidade? Eu acho que não. Ok, precisamente. Bom, ok. Outra coisa. Então. O que é isso? Sorry. So, this is someone, Yves Cochet, uh, who was. Uh, initially a mathematician in France, and who later became the Minister of Environment, or Ecology, if you prefer, of uh, Lionel Jospin, the Prime Minister, etc., etc., and now is the leader of this new movement called Collapsology. Collapsology. Uh, and this is, so the, the book is titled Devant l'effondrement, Confront, well, uh, suppose speak English, uh, um, confronting collapse, uh, um, yeah, facing facing collapse would be better. Facing collapse. Okay, so this is my tra uh, translation in English of uh, his motto here: the collapse of our globalized society is certain to take place in 2030, more or less, just a few years. Okay. Human beings, whatever their place in the hierarchy of power, can no longer significantly alter the fatal trajectory that leads to the final collapse. Okay, the problem for me is that while he writes this, he cites me. Yeah, I'm the model for these guys. Um, and I've never said such a thing. I've never said that the catastrophe was certain. Never. Um, so another quote. Oh yeah, no, that's uh, that's something else. Okay. Um, I've never, and that's the the what is at issue here? Is the catastrophe certain to occur? If it was, if it were certain to occur, the best thing we we, we would have to do would be to either kill ourselves, huh? or then. Seclaté in French, uh, uh, have, a, have a good time, decide to have a good time, uh, etc., since we are potentially dead already. Um, this is stupid to say that it's certain. So I said something else, which I'm trying to explain now. But this is another um, illustration. Uh, it's, a, it's a cartoon. Okay, I've been to show. It's a it's a cartoonist who does cartoons for Le Monde, the main uh, French uh, newspaper, and his heroes are penguins, uh, penguins who behave like us, actually. Well, 
And this is, uh, there are two, two, two uh, cartoons. The first one says, des solutions exist pour éviter l'effondrement. Solutions exist that will allow us to avoid the collapse. And immediately the others say, oh, you are a reactionary. This is how the left exists, or I uh, should say, survives in France. The left, the left is gone. The right is gone. Remain the extremes, and in the middle of the extremes, the hypercenter represented by Macron. Okay. Um, the simple fact of saying that there are solutions that will allow us to avoid the collapse makes it so that you are considered to be a reactionary. Only a revolution can change things, certainly not reforms. Uh, so this is the political dimension of the debate there. OK? No, 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 sei como é a situação aqui no Brasil, equivalente. Que só os extremos existem. Bom, não sei. Um, OK, everyone. Uh, all the participants, all the participants in the debate, cite this quote by Hans Jonas, one of the three, um, one of three or four uh, German thinkers. Um, are okay. The prophecy of doom is made to avert its coming. If we prophesy doom. It's for doom not to exist, to avoid doom. And it would be the height of injustice later to deride the alarmists because it didn't turn out so bad after all. To have been wrong may have been their merit. Another way to put it is to say that the prophet of doom, in order to be a good prophet, has to be a false prophet. In order to be a good prophet, he ha prophet, he has to be a false prophet because he has to prophesy something bad in order for this bad not to occur. You understand? And that's a paradox of the prophet. Uh, I repeat. Now, the extraordinary thing, it's uh, you know, as if history were making signs at us, is that there is another prophet of doom who had exactly the same name, except in English, it's not the same pronunciation, but it's Jonah, the biblical prophet that lived more or less the eighth century before our era. And in the Bible, there is a book of Jonah in which Jonah has to confront exactly the same paradox. So I'm not going to tell the story of Jonah. Uh, maybe most of you have heard of it. You certainly remember the three days and three nights in the belly of uh, the text says a big fish. A whale is not a fish, but okay, that's a detail. We don't uh, care. Um, but it's much more interesting than that. God, the Jewish God, of course, asked Jonah, his prophet, to prophesy the fall of Nineveh. Nineveh being the major enemies of the Jews. Uh, Nineveh, that's the current Mosul uh, in Iraq, okay, bombed by the Americans. Um, so, uh, and instead of complying with God's order, Jonah runs away. Why doesn't he carry out his task as a prophet? It's only at the end of the text that we understand why. So he runs away, he boards a boat that is going to uh, go in the direction of Gibraltar, Gibraltar. And you may remember God, the Jewish God, who is very angry at Jonah, starts a thunder, uh, um, lightning, etc., etc. And Jonah asks the sailors to throw him overboard. 
It's not the sailors who throw him overboard. It's Jonah himself. And the Jewish God is appeased. And Jonah is swallowed by a big fish, three nights, etc. It's, it's only at the end of the story that we understand why Jonah didn't comply with his God's order to prophesy the fall of Nineveh. Because this time, God asks for a second time Jonah to prophesy the fall of Nineveh. And Jonah complies. Well, he knows what it costs him to uh, disobey his God. Um, he complies. He prophesies uh, the fall of Nineveh. What happens is that the Ninevites repent and the Jewish God forgives them. But this, Jonah had anticipated it. Jonah, from the start, had anticipated that if he prophesied the fall of Nineveh, the Ninevites would repent, and he would, it would, he would turn out to be a false prophet. Because by the very fact that he prophesied something, this something would not happen. And Jonah didn't want to be a false prophet. So this is a real theological and metaphysical paradox. And this is a paradox of prophet of doom. The collapsologue or collapsologist haven't understood anything of that, this paradox. So the paradox can be expressed in this following way also. The paradox of enlightened doomsday, which I call so the Jonah or Jonah's paradox. To make the prospect of a catastrophe credible, remember that Noe was never taken seriously until he found this device. One must increase the ontological force of its inscription in the future. But to do this with too much success would be to lose sight of the goal, which is precisely to raise awareness and spur action so that the catastrophe does not take place. So you have to say, OK, this is not certain. This is necessary, which is very different. <coughs> In order for this thing that is necessary not to occur. Huge paradox. Well, this paradox, we are all familiar with it. It, it coexists with hum humankind since the beginning, since there are myths, there's Bible, there are novels, there are philosophical treaties, etc. I'm just going to give you one example. Go into Hollywood. Hollywood example. Actually, it's a tale by Voltaire called Zadig, who, um, whose purpose was to make fun of the Leibnizian system. Okay, called Zadig. This story was taken up by the greatest of American science fiction writers, Philip K. Dick, and made into a movie, unfortunately not at the same level, by Spielberg and it's called Minority Minority Report. Maybe some of you have seen it. So the story is the following. The police of the future can predict the crimes that are going to be committed. So actually the, predict, the prediction device, it's three creatures in a basin, which are the equivalent of the three in French, it's um, um, in, in English, it's the three. Um, oh my God! Uh, in Portuguese, I know the three fadas. No, fadas. 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 Eh? Fadas. In English, yeah. <laughs> the, thank you very much. But I was thinking on another term, by the way. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a detail. Um, yeah, the three. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, three is important, because that's the source of the phrase minority report, when they don't agree, the one that disagrees with the other two, writes a report, which is the minority report, but okay, so I'm not going to. Okay, so the future can be seen, murder can be prevented. In general, it's at the last split second that the, police, the policemen of the future stop the would-be murderer from doing his murder. 
uh, and the system is perfect, it's never wrong. Okay. So, well, in the case of the future is necessary, and it can be predicted. At one point in the movie, and that's the best part of the movie, there is a dialogue between the three or four policemen. This is the dialogue. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. We are arresting individuals who have broken no law, of course, because they haven't yet committed their crime. But, but they will. Fletcher responds, the commission of the crime itself is an abs is absolute metaphysics. That's in the movie. Yeah? Uh, maybe uh, very few people pay attention to that. I mean, the word metaphysics. The precogs, yeah, the three fair fairies, the three, yeah, uh, the precogs, see the future, and they are never wrong. And then Whitver, Whitver, sorry. But it's not the future if you stop it. Isn't that a fundamental paradox? And and Anderton, which is chief of the policeman, played by Tom Cruise, yes, it is. Okay, that's the movie. Yes, it is a fundamental paradox. It's not the future if you stop it. But this shouldn't be a paradox. If you think of prevention, that's exactly what prevention does. You predict that something bad is going to happen. You act in order to prevent this thing from happening. There is no metaphysical scandal, etc. If there is a paradox here, it's because we are dealing with prophecies. Prevention. Um, it's about uh, a, 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 a conditional prediction of the future, or a prediction of the conditional future, the future that would happen if we didn't prevent it from happening. But in the case of a prophecy, the prophet says what the future will be, and in a sense, does already. So this is a paradox. It's not just a creation of a metaphys uh, crazy metaphysicians. It's, uh, this is an example. Um, March 2003, as you may remember, um, um, the US was uh, thinking of intervening in Iraq, and they did, of course. Um, and this here you see Colin Powell showing the evidence that Saddam Hussein had the nuclear bomb, I mean, in this cube, etc. That was all bullshit, sorry to use a vulgar term. Um, and Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who, was, who had been the advisor of uh, President uh, Kennedy, uh, wrote, wrote somewhere, why is President Bush so keen on impersonating Tom Cruise? Huh? That is, we know, it's written, that Saddam Hussein has the nuclear bomb and is going to use it. Yeah, but we prevent him, prevent him from doing it by intervening. Well, so had Saddam Hussein had the nuclear bomb and had the installations been destroyed, of course he would not have used them. So this is a paradox. So let me tell you now, and that's the end, how I solved, yeah, you say yes to, that's the end, that's the <laughs> relief. <laughs> there are three ways of telling the future in human affairs. The first one is called prediction, to say, very simply. If I predict what's the evolution of the production of corn in China now, in the next uh, months or next years, <laughs> given the uncertainty with the virus, um, it's a prediction. Even if I publish this prediction in a very important newspaper, it will have almost no impact on the reality of the phenomena. That is, prediction is like treating human affairs as if they were physical, chemical, whatever, phenomena. There is a second method which was invented by two French philosophers. There is no word in English for it. In French, it's prospective, but in English, it's called, known as the scenarios method. It's to consider that the future is open. Uh, it's a branching tree, if you like. There are several scenarios. We are at a bifurcation, and we choose the best, what we think to be the best. 
But the third one, and I think that's the only one that is really useful when we have to deal with this predicted or announced catastrophes, climate change, nuclear war, biodiversity, etc., etc., run runaway technologies. The profit. What is the difference between the profit, the predictor, the prospectivist? Well, it's a profit knows. Think of Jonah, precisely, or think of Amos, or think of Jeremiah, or think of uh, Daniel. The prophet knows that his prophecy is going to produce causal effect in the world because he's an important person. People listen to him. So the prophet must take account of this fact, the fact that his prophecy produces causal effects in the world if he wants a future to confirm what he foretold. Huh? So the prophet has to solve the problem that can be, I had no, no slide for this, but all the better, uh, to solve uh, what is called in mathematics the search for a fixed point, that is an image of the future such, such that the reactions that the anticipation of that future will produce those reactions will produce the future from which we started. A loop between the future and the past. Now, the collapsologue or the collapsologist, uh, they don't do that at all. Uh, because their postulate, and I return to what I said at the beginning, is that human beings, whatever their place in the hierarchy of power, can no longer significantly alter the fatal trajectory, etc., etc. Yeah. So this feedback effect does, is not part of their thinking. And this is irresponsible, because these guys have an incredible success, at least in France. Huh? So I'm a member of the editorial committee of the publisher that publishes their books, and mine also, by the way. But, and I can tell you that the first book they published sold 100,000 copies, and it continues to, to sell. There are, I, know, I know of a great number of couples in France who decide not to make children. Why make children if the end of the world is in 2030, etc.? So my solution, so in two minutes. <laughs> It's a work of 25 years, but uh, two minutes. So what might be a good prophecy? Good prophecy, I mean by, by that there is this loop between future and past, or present, future and present. And it's a good prophecy in the sense that it will help avoid the catastrophe. What the collapsologists do increases the chances of the catastrophe to occur. They contribute to the panic that is already starting. So what's interesting, by the way, it's the uh, since the media plays such an important role, is that we have now the interference between the collapsology fear and the virus scare. Huh? So <laughs> what threat is going to dominate? We don't. It's too early to tell. So the palavra di ordine. Uh, is neither fatalism nor complacency, neither the more, the more um, deadly in English, neither the deadly um, pessimism of the collapsologist, nor complacency, complacency that is self-satisfaction, uh, or the what I call the uh, in French les optimistes béat, the the the, felicit, the, the happy uh, optimist. Uh, Go, there is no problem whatsoever, etc. Neither one nor the other. Fatalism leads to disaster. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And complacency leads also to disaster, what I call blissful blindness. Neither nor. So what? So I came up after many, much thinking, to a principle of superposition. Of course, I had in mind, but I've given up 
this metaphor, this analogy, the case of quantum mechanics, but this has nothing to do with what I'm trying to say here. We must imagine the future as being the future that a prophet prophesies, that is a necessary future. A future that is at the same time necessary and indeterminate. That's a th really the a challenge of thinking that through. The catastrophe, disaster or collapse, must be inscribed in the future so as to serve as deterrent. Uh, we don't want climate change to, uh, to make it so that uh, Holland or the Netherlands rather disappear or uh, the islands in the Pacific or the Bangladesh, etc. We don't want that to happen. Um, but the non-catastrophe, but construed as avoidance of the catastrophe, because that's the definition of uh, happiness today. It's that the catastrophe doesn't take place. The non-catastrophe must also be inscribed in the future as a reason for hope. If we succeed, the weight of the catastrophe in that superposition must be very, very small, infinitely small. In English, in mathematics, we say, say uh, vanishingly small. In French, it would be évanescent. The évanescent, vanish, the word. Um, um, so the weight of the catastrophe in that future must be very, very small, but it must be present. There is an epsilon here, as they say in mathematics, that has to be strictly positive, positive, although it's very, very, very small. And the superposition of the catastrophe and the non-catastrophe creates what is called in, uh, let's say, physics, but also in mathematics and also in metaphysics, an indeterminacy, I'm using here a German word that was used by Heisenberg. Uh, you know, you have heard of the principle of uncertainty. Huh? Okay, it's the wrong translation. The German word is Unbestimmtheit, which means not uncertainty but in determinism, which is very different. Uncertainty deals with what we know or not know, epistemic category. In determinism, it's metaphysical, ontological. It's uh, what is and is not. Um, so, conclusion. A more literary conclusion, maybe more easily uh, understood. The metaphysics that must serve as the foundation for prudence adapted to the time of catastrophes consists in projecting oneself into a time that follows the catastrophe, the future perfect, per, future perfect device, and in seeing it, the catastrophe, retrospectively as an event at once necessary and accidental. It is a resulting indeterminacy, you could also say undecidability, of the catastroph catastrophic future that may deter us from acting foolishly, and certainly not, as this collapsologic may make me say, not the certainty of the catastrophe. So we have here a fusion of chance with destiny. Well, this is a story that is as old as humankind, when you think of it. Many myths, many stories, many parables, allegories talk of that. Just two examples. Oedipus, it's written from the start that Oedipus will kill his father and marry, make love with his mother. So many precautions are taken for this, to, to prevent this from happening. But in the end, that's what happens. But how does it happen? At the crossroads, Oedipus runs into a disgruntled old man and kills him. Kills him. He doesn't know, of course, that he's his father, that he goes to Thebes, dead Thebes, and uh, marry. Okay, so we have here the coincidence of a form of fatalism and accident. A more uh, literary example now, it's uh, Camus' novel, Albert Camus' novel, L'étranger, The Stranger, The Outsider. It's written from the start of the novel that he will, Merceau, that's his name, will end up on the gallows, guillotined. 
Why? Because he doesn't weep, doesn't cry at his mother's funeral. But even at the, in the Algeria of Camus, you didn't end up under the guillotine if you didn't cry at your mother's funeral. So Meursault has to do something for this to happen. And this something is a crime. He kills an Arab on the Algiers beach that he had never seen before. And Camus, who wrote about his own novel, said it was an accident. It was an accident. But if it was an accident, that doesn't prove that a man who doesn't weep at his mother's funeral ends up under the guillotine. There is something wrong here. Etranger. <laughs> gratuitous homicide and innocent murder. That's a paradox. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Okay, this was, okay, that was the, uh, the nuclear case, but I'm not, no time. And my final citation is to reconcile, reconcile myself with uh, Heidegger, if not Heidegger, his uh, favorite poet, Hölderlin. Wo aber die Gefahr ist? Wächst das Rettende auch, which, well, I have it in Portuguese here. La onze cresce au perigo, cresce tambien, who can solve? Oh, okay. I think this is the end. Yeah. No, it's not the end. The end is this. I don't want this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. So I think we have time for some questions or discussion from, from us also here. Your question about yeah. Can I add something yes, to my please. previous question? Yeah. I mean, this is uh, very, very interesting and so provoking all your, all, all, your whole presentation. And I have a provocation about the book you are writing. I, because I am a political scientist and professor of international relations, my bias is in relation to ground this kind of philosophical res reflections on the history of the Cold War and the post-Cold War. Yeah. Okay? So it would be very interesting because we have right now a lot of data from the Cold War is much more uh, data about elites mindset, particularly the Soviet and the American, and how there was a process of learning, not perfect, but there, for sure there was a process of, of, of learning. Okay, and more recently, during the 21st century, we have mass, uh, 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 mass public surveys about uh, the perception about uh, catastrophes and so on. So, is in your book, go, you, are you going to uh, let's say interlink con, more or less continuously this more philosophical reflection with the history of humanity in the last 70 years in which for sure the 17 70, 70. Oh, 70 years yeah, so in order to to be more uh, I would say more appealing eh? uh, more deep way of present, I agree with your view, eh? enlightenment catastrophes. Um, I, I, I would say that I have been, since I was a child, because of my education was an elite education in Argentina, and I, we spent 10 days in my, uh, when I was in, at school during the Cuban Missile Crisis, not classes, just being at school uh, waiting for the end of the world and listening the radio was very powerful, shaping my life. So I have been always thinking <laughs> enlightenment. I don't call this way, but yeah, have been always in my mind, okay? And I think this has, depending on the periods, has been in the mind of significant parts of the elites and highly educated population in the world, okay? And so I think, for example, the important that the whole study of nuclear winter of Carl Sagan have on the mass on the publics of American and Soviets, eh? yeah. uh, pushing in the direction of of, uh, of uh, stopping the 
the, the, the escalation, let's say, that was launched by the, both the, particularly Reagan and Ropov 1982 way of clash and perceiving the world. Uh, Cristiana Figueres, Cristiana Figueres, who lead uh, the United uh, Nations Climate uh, Conference, uh, she just published a book where uh, whose message is very optimistic, but is preceded by the idea that we have just 10 years to apply the solutions. And uh, this idea that we have just 10 years appears also in Rockstrom book from, no, not uh, Rockstrom, who, who is a climatologist uh, uh, who did the, the, the limits, yes, yes, the limits, the planetary boundaries, etc. In 2011, he published a book where we had just this decade to solve the, the, the problem. Um, McKinsey just published a report uh, where uh, the, the message is the same. Um, have we some time? We have just as this decade. What do you think about this kind of periodization that, that uh, is applied by, not by collapsologue, but by uh, the, the scientific and political elite who is thinking on these issues. Maybe I can add yeah. Yeah. to that. Uh, my question has to do with the idea of enlightenment, uh, doomsaying, yeah. and climate change too. So uh, I will base my question on one excerpt of one of your books, which is Economy and the Future. I will read this, just this paragraph. It's a short paragraph. You say in this book, the main challenges posed by major catastrophes, whether they are moral, natural, industrial, or technological in character, is that their potential victims find it almost impossible to believe that disaster is imminent, even though they, are, they have available to them all the information needed to conclude that the worst is very likely, if not actually certain, to happen. It's not owing to a lack of knowledge that people do not act, but to the fact that knowledge is not transformed into belief. This is the obstacle that we must overcome. The method of enlightened doomsaying counsels us to act as if a catastrophic occurrence were our fate, but nonetheless a fate that we are free to reject. Okay, climate change is a very well-known problem today. I think that we are all positive about that. And stopping climate change depends on uh, triggering a lot of actions about a lot of different actors yeah. all around the world. And my question is how to transform this knowledge that we have about climate change in belief, into belief, and this belief into action. So what kind of institutional mechanisms, instruments, we can conceive in order to do that? Okay. The, the huge question. The fourth question. No, 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 no. Just comments. I think, like, you know, Mark is here, like the IPCC 1.5 uh, report, the word also emphasized in 2018 the time, space that we have to transform and to address, like, societal pressures, like climate change, and then the scale that we need to do that. So, I think just to complement the different uh, approaches. And, and try not to, to give like a gloomy or a dark scenario, but like a, it's a message, but not like a catastrophic one, but like we have this time yeah. left. That's true. Okay. Yeah. So, three questions. Please. Yes. Three questions. Thank you. Three questions that are around the same topic. And you, then both of you. And then I start with uh, you. The, um, so, since you are Argentinian, there, there is a quote I wanted to make by Borges. Borges. Um, I thought I had a slide, but I don't, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so, let me think. El porvenir es inevitable, pero puede no acontecer. Everything is there. So, there is a kind of destiny. But in a sense, we have the choice not to let it, not 
not to let it occur, this destiny. And, but he has a, a, a third sentence, which says, which is, Dios, Dios acecha a los intervalos. A los intervalos. Dieu, uh, sorry, Dieu. God watches at the intervals. Watches or um, is there. Huh? Um, so let's replace God by man. And we have, in a sense, a catastrophe, uh, what I call the catastrophe, uh, enlightened doom saying. Um, the future is inevitable, but it may, may in English, it would be, not can, it may not occur. Um, and that's a transition, by the way, to the, uh, your, your questions. But regarding the, the nuclear issue, this book that you are referring to, it's already published. The new book is, uh, is about catastrophes in general and the collapsologue. Yeah, but it exists only in French. I don't know if you read French, because if you, you don't, okay. But there will be, there, there is a... Uh, this is the book that the, 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 the title, you, do, you didn't remember and afterwards you remember. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, so, so the, the book... It already existed. The, the book, the book is titled, the book is titled uh, Cette guerre qui ne peut pas avoir lieu, this war that, the, the, cette guerre qui ne peut pas avoir lieu, this war that cannot take place, but it's ironical, of course, it can very well take place. We have all the elements to uh, the capacity, the technological capacity, and, and also it's highly probable. Um, so it's ironical. It cannot take place in the moral sense. Okay, that's the idea. And the subtitle is more explicit. It's essay in uh, nuclear metaphysics. Okay, but anyway, and, and it's in French. Okay, so it's uh, um, so I could speak for hours about this book, but um, yeah, it's not maybe the time to uh, do it. No, but okay, I have to answer the. Uh, these three guys, as they say in English, uh, including, yeah, you know, on, on the Stanford campus, you see three women, three women uh, sitting on the bench, and you say, hi, guys. Yeah. Yeah, it's not very, they are women, of course, but they are called guys. Yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> You've seen that, yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I could say, taking advantage of my age, that, you know, in terms of delay, um, in 1975, when I was working with Ivan Illich, we would also say this. There is a book by Ivan Illich, uh, the French tr translation of which I worked on with Illich, called Energy and Equity. Okay. Um, so, writing things like this, have had no effect whatsoever on the course of things. So, you know, it's not if you are a writer that you can hope to uh, change uh, things, not even ideas. Um, now, I'm working, I, I was a member of the French section of the IPCC for a while. I'm no longer, and I worked a lot with uh, the great French climatologist, Jean Jouzel. Jean Jouzel, like his name uh, is was the vice president of the IPCC for many years. Um, his approach is different from the authors that you just cited. He thinks, or maybe it's not that he thinks, he um, thinks it's responsible on, the, on his part not to kill hope, not to kill hope. So, hence the title of the book I'm currently writing. Um, the, what is it? Um, there is still time. There is still time. Il est encore temps. There is still time. I in that thing, thing. Uh, no, the, these, these, of course, these guys, as you said very well, as opposed to the French collapsologists, don't give a deadline. Uh, they don't say 2030, plus or minus one year or two. I mean, that's, Thank you very much. Huh? Plus, okay. Um, 
Which is stupid, by the way, because uh, if there is, if we hold for sure that these things will happen before 2030 or in 2030, that means that in 2029, the year before, all credits will be reduced to zero, their value. Uh, you're not going to lend money to people whom you know won't, won't any longer exist in one year time. But if, it, if it's, tw it's, it's called in, uh, the philosophy of economics, by the way, the backward induction paradox. If, it, if we know for sure that the end is in 2030, well, that's not true. The end will be in 2019. But if it's in 2019, for the same reason, it's in 2018, et cetera, et cetera, all the way backwards to now. If we know for sure when the catastrophe is going to take place, actually it takes place now, and not in, because, of the cred because of credit, you see. Uh, without credit, in particular, without money, our societies, industrial societies, couldn't function. You understand? So it's, it's self-contradictory. You don't give dates. You don't give dates. Um, so they're very well, 10 years, you know, 20 years ago, it was already 10 years. Huh? You know the, the, the joke, uh, the hairdressers, tomorrow uh, we, we, uh, we'll shave you uh, for free. Huh? OK, but tomorrow, it's tomorrow. Or, sorry to say that, because I love Brazil. It's a famous joke about Brazil. Uh, the America of tomorrow, huh? but it's always tomorrow. And the first one to say, to say it was uh, Stefan Zweig, who com committed suicide in, uh, yeah, in uh, Barbacena, I was. Well, um, yeah, so um, no, don't give dates. Certainly don't give any dates. Of course it's urgent, we are on the brink, but that's it. Uh, a more, much more interesting metaphor, by the way, is the one used by a um, colleague, now friend of mine at uh, Stanford. <laughs> you may uh, run into him. His name is, um, his name is, um, oh my God, fatigue, Alzheimer maybe, um, um, William Perry. He was the Secretary of State of uh, President um, Clinton, not Secretary of State, sorry, Secretary of Defense of President Clinton. Um, we th we um, must be grateful to him for uh, helping the world avoid uh, one or two near misses that they say in the mid US military. That is uh, almost a uh, boom, near misses. Anyway, he wrote a book, published a book two, two years ago told called um, My Journey on the Nuclear Brink. So the, the brink is this, huh? on the nuclear brink. So it's much more interesting, because the usual metaphor is we are going straight into the void. No, it's, the metaphor here is different. It's a journey, so it's a travel, along the brink my journey at the nu uh, nuclear brink. It's a very different metaphor, which means that the slightest swerve on the right or on the left will precipitate you into the void. Do you understand? So it's a journey, it's not a whoosh, it's a journey, and, and so we don't know when this swerve uh, will occur. No date. Okay, so I, I yeah. need to go because I have a commitment. Right. Thank you very much. No, you're very welcome. Very, very nice. Thank you. And then I thank just you. would like to thank you, Viola, to, to open to Marcos Bukeridi. He's uh, the director of the Biological Institute or Biological Science. Institute, Institute of Bioscience. Bioscience. Yeah. In, uh, here with me. And then I think you have like a burning comment. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, you say he asked me to. Yeah. Yeah. Gold. 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 G
That's too much. Uh, thank you, José Eli, Professor José Eli. He knows I'm a fan. Uh, 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 thank you very much. It was really uh, challenging and uh, fascinating. Uh, we have been discussing a lot here at the University of São Paulo the, this issue of uh, catastrophism. There was an article last week on the Jornal da USP uh, that we were criticized. Uh, I, I, I didn't write the article, was a journalist, but I was in, in, uh, in the article as well, and uh, he used one phrase of mine that is, prepare for the worst. Okay, yes. I, I, yeah. I, work, I work in the IPCC, I just would like to make one, one final comment uh, and allow you to comment as well, if I'm wrong in the interpretation. Uh, uh, being working in the IPCC in, in, in chapter 4, that is the chapter uh, we had to write about the transitions, what are the options we have uh, for the future, uh, and uh, being working back to back with uh, Patricia, that is the chapter 5 on the sustainability and the po how the poverty will be affected. Uh, my impression from what you showed is that we, we are always we, we have many bifurcations, right? We, we, uh, there are bifurcations that are personal. You're going to die tomorrow, you have a disease, or this, this is the catastrophe, the final catastrophe is the death for us. And maybe the final catastrophe will be the disappearance of uh, humanity as a whole, but we don't know whether there are many humanities around, around the universe and uh, we are just one of them. And it seems to me that we are we, we try to, in your, your three uh, possibilities of uh, looking at cat catastrology, that was uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, collapsology, uh, one of them is looking at the linear world, so I, I, can, I can forecast linearly, it's very easy to say what's going to happen in the future, the economists love that, they work, they work, on, they work on, this, on this universe very well, and the other is when you, when you, when you hit a bifurcation. And this is chaos, uh, yes. this is really chaos, so you are going to bifurcate and bifurcate again and again and again, and then uh, you, you, you go to chaos, right? Yeah. So when you, when you hit a point that you have a, a, a bifurcation, you, you have to decide. And this is the scenarios, because you can have trifurcations, you can have many, and this is, this is what we see uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the IPCC as the many different scenarios that we can choose to go and depends on what we do. And then the comment I would like to make is that it's not that, that it, uh, 2030 we, will have, uh, we, we'll, we are going to have problems. We already started. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, during this last night many people lost their houses because of the rain that yeah. is too strong yeah. Yeah. and has a flavor of uh, climate change. Maybe it's not all climate change, but has a flavor. The article last week talks about that. It would be yeah. interesting to, to look at it. So uh, for, for, for people who died, that was the final catastrophe, the individual catastrophe. Yeah. For people who lost the house, it's a catastrophe for the family. And you go on in the layers until we think of the planet as a whole. But it, it has already started. It's going slowly. We, well, the, the point is, can, can we choose, uh, uh, can we find buttons to press uh, to go towards a different direction? And one comment I would like you to make is that everything seems to be a transition, a Lyapunov yeah. index, that uh, you, 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 you change the equilibrium from one point to another point. So uh, transition is not uh, necessarily bad. Many things that we are doing now due to the climate change, like for example using biomaterials and being, being more sustainable, this is, this is really good. So we are, going to, we are going towards this direction very quickly or, or faster than we would if we, didn't have the, if we didn't have the climate change to push us. So uh, we are, we are not, uh, I think there is no catastrophe in this, 
in, at this point. You, you can think of a catastrophe like the Big Bang is a catastrophe, yeah, yeah. but created us, right? exactly. created the universe. So there is no catastrophe, in fact. Uh, is this a false dilemma that there is a catastrophe or not? Yeah. You understand my point? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The main problem seems to be, and I love the, the, Argentinians, the Argentinians' blind guys, yeah. So I, it made it made me uh, remember of my own government, right? The, the guys going all blind, and then let's go, and they're going. Uh, so the, since 1997, we are advising that this strong rain, for example, I'm just taking one example that's happening yeah. now. This strong uh, this this uh, strong rains would happen. They would be much stronger, more frequent. And we, uh, most of the population was blind. So the, the problem seems, seems to be to, to, how, to, to know how many, how many of the guys that are crossing the roads are blind. And what is the probability of, uh, of uh, two blind guys to, to meet and then go towards a catastrophe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a fundamental question, too. Um, there would be so many things to say. Um, but what you, what you said, especially between the lines, if I can put it this way, corresponds to a critique that has been, that has been made to my work uh, from the start, in a, in a sense. It's to um, the bringing together the nuclear case, nuclear war, nuclear explosion, etc., and climate change is wrong because in one case, it's an event. Well, it could be a series of events of bombs, or uh, it can, let's say, uh, let's say an exchange for like uh, the summer of uh, three years ago, which I, where I was in California between Trump and Kim, the North Korean guy. Really, we, we uh, William Perry uh, was working with him at the time, thought we we're that close, that close to a, uh, uh, nuclear exchange between uh, Kim and uh, the U.S. Uh, we're very, very close. Okay, so it's more a kind of event, whereas, as you said very well, uh, climate change, it's a series of uh, not even events, it's a process, it's more, etc. So, I think I can answer this objection, I can respond to this objection, but um, that would it would require much time to explain how. But first, I want to make a literary, um, a literary um, uh, remark. Um, I suppose that most of you have seen the beautiful movie by um, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now. It's based on two literary works. First, Joseph Conrad's. Um, the Heart of Darkness, but also a poem by, um, by uh, T.S. Eliot, American, then British, Nobel laureate in literature, um, called The Hollow Man. And at the end of the movie, um, Duval, the actor, uh, who, who plays the role of the uh, deputy of, the, uh, of, of Kurt, the uh, Orson Welles, the uh, recites this poem from A to Z. The Hollow Man. The last four verses of this poem are known to any English-speaking uh, person who has a minimum of culture, of course. And th these are the following. Three verses are the same, repeated three times. So, This is the way the world ends. This way, como o mundo vem a Termina. And the last verse is not with a bang, but a whimper. Not with, uh, no, a uh, whimper, it's a uh, gémissement. Un gémit. Okay. Not, non comme un bang, but a whimper. So I think climate change, one could say climate change, and that corresponds to what I was saying. There is no catastrophe in a sense, no special event. It's a process, but it's a gémissement. It's a long whimper. Okay, but now, this is the um, literary remark. Now, how can I deal with that? 
um, I can bring these two things together, nuclear war and uh, climate change together, thanks to uh, the concept of self-transcendence, but applied not to the future this time, but to evil. Evil is self-transcendent in the sense that it comes from us, but it appears to us as coming from somewhere else. Uh, in the case of uh, nuclear war, you could say there are two partners to uh, Kim and uh, Trump, I mean, etc. Yes, but one of the greatest philosophers described, uh, David K. Lewis, doesn't matter, described the logic of nuclear, the nuclear situation in terms of a tiger. You don't tangle with tiger, you don't tease tiger, you don't excite a tiger. That's, that's all there is to think about. Okay, what, what's this tiger? What, where does this tiger come from? Where does it come from? Um, a, kyver, a tiger, and I respond to a very good question about intention, human intentions. Precisely, the danger doesn't come from the enemy. It comes from a tiger. A tiger that all of us, we created. It's a self-exteriorization of our violence. It's very likely that the next time a nuclear bomb will explode over a population will be the result not of a will, of a decision, but of, of an accident. Hence the metaphor of the tiger. Now, isn't it the same in terms of climate change? Because that climate change is the result of all our actions, the smallest, etc. And it seems to us to come from a radical exteriority. It's a it's a, a, a mass that falls on us, but we forget that this mass was first projected towards the sky by us. And so that's how. Another way to to uh, to respond to your objection. Well, it was not meant to be an objection, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. it's a critique that has made to me. Um, is to say that the climatologist summarize all these little acts, these little facts, these little phenomena with one criterion, below or above 1.5 Celsius degrees Celsius. Huh? So that's it. everything seems to be summarized by this, huh? with this idea, which is certainly to a large extent physically false, I mean, uh, physically unwarranted, not justified, that 1.5 is really a tipping point. Actually, we don't know. Uh, first it was 2 degrees, now it's 1.5 degrees, okay? Uh, but nevertheless, that serves as a kind of criterion. In the same way that a bomb explodes or not, in the same way we will transgress this limit of 1.5 or we won't transgress. Okay, that's the... Um, but it, you could say it's a cheap way of circumventing the difficulty, not with a bang, but a whimper. Um, uh, so I want to show this. Uh, first, okay, I wanted to give my, uh, sorry, my coordinates, but uh, maybe it's not necessary. Will you distribute my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah? This is um, the monsters of Notre Dame. Now they cannot be seen because Notre Dame, as you know, uh, it, it ex still exists, but and a final tribute to my uh, grandson Umeu Neto. In that time, it was, it was killed Obaminho do Brasil, bon. <laughs> and today he looks like this, very different. <laughs> Well, um, I would just would like to thank you all, thank especially Jean-Pierre Depuy for this brilliant exposition and uh, insightful debate. Uh, so many questions, I myself find having so many questions to you that yeah. at this time we cannot be addressing them, but I'm sure people will reach out. So thank you, special thanks in behalf of IAI to you. And thanks for Ricardo and um, Edu, you call you uh, Matias, but <laughs> Eduardo. And Eduardo who is not here. Thank you all.